I'm comforting you by telling you we're not going through the tribulation. The things that are happening in the world right now are bad, but this is a Sunday school picnic compared to what's about to happen during the tribulation. And we will not be here for that because Jesus is coming for us. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Now, remember that term there, falling away. I want to talk about that more. The falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed. That's the Antichrist, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was uh, still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. But the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him with the splendor of his coming. So let me go back into that text because this is very important. Now, the Apostle Paul had written 1 Thessalonians to the church at Thessalonica, okay, the book of 1 Thessalonians. Well, after he wrote that letter to them, a uh, rumor went around that the, Jesus had come and they had been left behind. Well, that would be very troubling as you can understand. Why would the Thessalonians be upset that the tribulation had started if they already believed that they had to go through the tribulation and had to die as martyrs for Jesus. Well, they were upset because Paul had told them that they would be raptured and not have to go through the tribulation and be martyred. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So just weeks later, or a couple of months later, after 1 Thessalonians was written, the Apostle Paul is writing the book of 2 Thessalonians to clarify to the people, to comfort them, to let them know you have, Jesus has not come and you haven't been left behind. And he begins by saying, I want you to understand, don't be troubled, don't be bothered, because that day isn't going to come until the falling away comes first. And the word falling away there, that two words, falling away, is one Greek word, apostasia where we get our word apostasy, and it can be translated as a falling away from truth. It can also be translated departure. Now, in the first seven translations of the Bible into English, that was translated departure. In other words, rapture. That day isn't going to come until the rapture comes, and then the lawless one will be revealed. He says it again. He says, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed. The restrainer in the world today is the Holy Spirit in the church. Remember, the church was born on the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit fell upon people, the uh, 120 in the upper room, and the church began. The church began with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible tells us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in the church 
is what's restraining sin in the earth right now. And the apostle Paul says, you know what's restraining during this period of time. And he's going to restrain until he is taken out of the way. Okay. And so I believe that the rapture happens, the departure happens, then the lawless one will be revealed. I don't believe that we as Christians will know who the Antichrist is. Let me tell you, I've got some, I've got some guesses of who the Antichrist is. There's some wonderful candidates in the world right now, and I'm not going to name names, but I'm telling you, the church will leave, then the Antichrist will be revealed. Greetings. I'm Dr. Paul Felter. Welcome to my video podcast where I expose church fallacies and flawed Christian traditions with Bible truth. We let the Bible speak for itself. Let's begin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The two often misunderstood passages in that passage are the day of Christ and a falling away. I will address the phrase day of Christ first by making the first sentences, verses 1 and 2, more clear by removing the subordinate clause. As you know, a subordinate clause adds information to the sentence, but does not affect its primary meaning. Removing the subordinate clause will not change the meaning of the sentence. It will make the sentence easier to understand. Now, the subordinate clause is the phrase, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. By removing that phrase, a clearer understanding of the sentence comes forth. Don't worry, we'll get to the meaning of the subordinate clause shortly. Here is the sentence of verse 1 and 2 without the subordinate clause. Now we beseech you, brethren, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Paul is pleading with the believers at Thessalonica not to be shaken in mind. In other words, not to be upset. Don't be anxious or fearful or troubled or disturbed about receiving a word, a forged letter, or a visit from man or spirit claiming that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, before we go further, we must define the phrase day of Christ within the context of the passage. Everyone knows the three rules of real estate, location, location, location. But many forget the three rules of Bible interpretation are context, context, and context. We must stay in context when defining the meaning of the phrase day of Christ. So many pastors, teachers, and especially modern Bible interpretations, assign meanings to words based on definitions found in Strong's, Vines, or some other Greek lexicon, ignoring the context of the passage. Words can have different meaning depending on the context. A little sanctified common sense goes a long way here. Let's look at some possibilities. Number one, the phrase day of Christ could refer to the rapture but the believers would not have been upset or troubled. They would have been happy and rejoicing as they would soon be meeting the Lord in the air. Number two, the phrase day of Christ could refer to the day of the Lord, the seven-year tribulation. That would give them good reason to be upset and troubled if the tribulation was about to begin. Number three, had Paul previously taught them to endure part or all of the seven-year tribulation, then there would be no reason to be upset and ask Paul for clarification on the matter. That would be what they would have expected. Number four, but had Paul taught that the rapture would precede the seven-year tribulation, then news that the tribulation was at hand or beginning would be very troubling, as that contradicted Paul's teaching. So, it is obvious that the day of Christ is a reference to the day of the Lord, the seven-year tribulation. 
The use of the word Christ in this phrase, day of Christ, is not an issue as Jesus Christ is Lord. Day of Christ, day of the Lord, same thing. It's also obvious that Paul taught the believers that the rapture precedes the tribulation. Hearing otherwise would have made them troubled and upset. Let's add the second sentence to complete the context. Now we beseech you, brethren, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Paul then implores them not to be deceived. Don't give any regard to those that bring teachings that contradict what I have taught you. Don't let them deceive you by any means, by word, by fake letter, or by an evil spirit. We are commanded many times in the New Testament not to be deceived. As we are living in the closing days of the dispensation of grace, deception and propaganda rule the day. Don't you be deceived either. Let's look at the subordinate clause I previously removed as it sets the subject of the passages. The phrase is, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at which believers are gathered unto him is the rapture. The believers at Thessalonica wanted confirmation about the timing of the rapture with respect to the tribulation, the day of Christ. Let's continue in verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Notice the phrase, that day shall not come. What day is Paul referring to with the phrase, that day? That day refers to a day previously mentioned in the text, the day of Christ, the tribulation. Paul clearly states that day, the day of Christ, the tribulation, will not come except something else comes first, the falling away, the apostasia. Before the tribulation can begin, there must be a falling away or an apostasia. But what does the word apostasia mean? The word only occurs one other time in the King James Bible, that being Acts 21, 21. And they that are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Here the Greek word apostasia is translated forsake. Forsaking Moses means forsaking or departing from the law of Moses, including circumcision and keeping the Jewish customs. How has the word apostasia been used historically? Here is our primary text taken from the Geneva Bible of 1599, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our assembling unto him, that ye be not suddenly moved from your mind, nor troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as it were from us, as though the day of Christ were at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a departing first, and that the man of sin be disclosed, even the son of perdition. The Greek word apostasia has been translated as departing or departure throughout the history of the English Bible. Even Jerome's Vulgate of the 4th century uses the Latin phrase venerit decessio primum, is translated as departure comes first. The following chart shows the history of the English Bible with respect to the translation of the Greek word apostasia. 332, Jerome's Latin Vulgate, Departure First. 1384, Wycliffe's Bible, Departing First. 1526, Tyndale Bible, Departing First. 
1535, the Coverdale Bible, departing first. 1539, the Kramer Bible, departing first. 1576, Breach's Bible, departing first. 1583, Beza Bible, departing first. 1608, Geneva Bible, departing first. The King James Bible, falling away. Historically, the Greek word apostasia has been translated as departing in all the English Bibles since Wycliffe penned the first English Bible in 1384. Why the King James translators chose to use the phrase falling away remains a mystery. Another interesting aspect of verse 3 is that Paul uses a definite article before the word apostasia. By using a definite article, Paul draws attention to the fact that the apostasia is a singular event, not a long process such as falling away from the faith. Ever since the first century, people have been falling away from the faith in one part of the world or another. Even in the Apostle Paul's day, he noted the following. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia are turned away from me, of whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. 2 Timothy 1, 15. The apostasia of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, is not a long process of years, but a singular event. The rapture easily satisfies the context and the grammar. Also, the apostasia, being the departure, is congruent with verse 1, our gathering unto the Lord, the rapture. That interpretation gives continuity to the passage, as the topic of verse 1, the rapture, is carried through in verse 3, the departing. Let me give you my paraphrase of the passage. Now we implore you, brethren, with respect to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him at the rapture, that ye be not distressed, upset, or be troubled, neither by an evil spirit, nor by a spoken word, nor by a forged letter, as from us, that the day of the Lord, the tribulation, is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of the Lord, shall not come, except the rapture come first, and then the man of sin be revealed, the Antichrist, the son of perdition. The timeline for the passage is this. Number one, the departing, the rapture comes first, with the rapture being the context stated in the first verse, you would expect the text to reference the rapture in a subsequent sentence. Otherwise, there is no continuity in the passage. The poorly translated falling away in the King James Bible is the rapture of the church. This is the crux of the issue. The falling away is the departure, which is the rapture, not a falling away from the faith. Thessalonians. <laughs> uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Is the mic working okay? Um, well, the title of this session is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, uh, Apostasy or Rapture. Apostasy or Rapture. So let me go ahead and read this verse to you, because that's where we're going to be spending our time in this session. Paul writes, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself over every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. What we're focused on is verse 3, let, first part of the verse, let no one deceive you in any way, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Now, when you get into this subject, what you begin to discover, and this is what Bill was talking about as he was introducing me, is you have two views on it. The majority view is the apostasy, or the, it's the Greek noun apostasia, 
The majority view is it's speaking of some kind of spiritual departure. Um, it's speaking of the unbelieving world embracing the Antichrist. And most Christians believe that that's what that verse is speaking of, and that's the sign that Paul is giving. But what you will be startled to discover is there is an entirely different view on it, that the apostasia is not a spiritual departure, but it is a physical departure. It is a spatial departure. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, I could care less. I mean, whether it's a spiritual departure or a physical departure, what does it really matter? The reason it matters is because there has been, um, probably for the last couple hundred years or so, a vigorous debate amongst people who believe in a tribulation period and a kingdom following regarding when does the rapture happen. You have pre-tribulationalism, mid-tribulationalism, post-tribulationalism. I mean, a lot of times you feel like you're in the tribulation itself trying to navigate your way through these views. There's pre-wrath rapture, there's partial rapture. The viewpoint of the Compass Ministries, which is the viewpoint of the scripture, <laughs> is that the rapture takes place before the tribulation period begins. Mid-tribulationists believe, no, the rapture is going to take place in the middle of the tribulation period. Post-tribulationalists believe that the rapture will take place at the end of the tribulation period. Pre-wrath rapturists, I call it three quarters, they believe we're going to be here for about three quarters of the tribulation period. May I just say that if it is true that this, in verse 3, is talking about a physical departure and not a spiritual departure, then there's nothing else to argue about. Because what Paul says is, let no one deceive you, for it will not come, it, referring to the day of the Lord and all of the events following, it will not come until the apostasy comes what? First. Uh, the Greek adjective first is the Greek word proto, which means first. And if first comes a physical departure, then it's game, set, match for the top view, pre-tribulationalism. That's why it matters. Apostasy will be something that has specific time-bound qualities, just like the man of sin coming. Just like the man of sin will be specific and time-bound, the coming apostasy or departure will be that specific and that time-bound. That's what that definite article communicates. The Greek language, interestingly enough, does not even need the definite article to make the noun definite. It just adds intensification. And so many people believe that when Paul uses this definite article, which is not needed to make something definite, he is referring the apostasy to something he's already talked to them about. I believe, as I'll show you in a moment, what he was talking to them about in 1 Thessalonians was the rapture of the church. So when he says the apostasy he is speaking of, as I'll try to show you in just a minute, the rapture of the church. Does the Greek noun apostasia, can it refer to a physical departure? Let me quote from Liddell and Scott, a well-known uh, Greek lexicon, and this is what they say. These are terms they use to describe apostasia, rebellion against God, apostasy. Now that would refer to the spiritual departure view. But it can also refer to a departure, a disappearance, or a distance. That would refer to the physical removal view. So quite clearly, the noun apostasia can refer to a physical removal. Liddell and Scott indicates that. Take a look also down in verses 6 and 7. Look again at this context. He says... And you know what restrains him now, 
so that in his time he will re be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who would be the third member of the Trinity? Why do I think that it's the Holy Spirit here? The Holy Spirit is omnipotent, all-powerful. And only God himself, deity itself, could hold back Satan's man of the hour. The Holy Spirit fits that description. Moreover, in the Greek text, there is a switch in gender in the participle restrainer. It is neuter in verse 6, the word restrainer, and then it becomes masculine in verse 7. Neuter to masculine. I can't think of a better description of the Holy Spirit because the Greek noun for spirit is pneuma, which is a neuter noun, but did not Jesus refer to the Spirit as He in the upper room? When He comes, did, he not, did Jesus not say that? When He comes, He will guide the world, or He will guide you, rather, as the apostles into all truth. Beyond that, we know from other scriptures that the Holy Spirit is very active in the world the way this restrainer is. The Holy Spirit was striving with man for 120 years before the flood. It's actually the Holy Spirit that places men and women under conviction in this age to receive Jesus Christ. So an understanding of the Holy Spirit as the restrainer fits very well here because of the Spirit's activity in the world. So here's the deal. The restrainer is holding back the Antichrist. The restrainer is the omnipotent Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question. Where does the Holy Spirit live? In the child of God. He's in us forever. The Holy Spirit permanently indwells all Christians. So therefore, all spirit indwelt Christians, which is the only type of Christian you can have, right? All spirit indwelt Christians must be removed before the Antichrist can come to power. Number nine, early Bible translators all recognized the noun apostasy as communicating physical departure. As the Bible was translated very early on, what you'll discover is all of the translators were open to a physical departure interpretation. In fact, Jerome, going back to the 4th century, translated the Bible, the New Testament, particularly from Greek into Latin. And that's called the Latin Vulgate. It's called the Vulgate because Vulgate means common, because that was the common language of the day. He wanted the Bible readable in the common language of the day, which in the fourth century was Latin. So from the word Vulgate, we get the word vulgar, as in common speech, earthy speech. And so that's why it's named the Latin Vulgate. And so when Jerome translated 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, he used the Latin word, and I don't have much Latin pronunciation, I'm sorry, but I'll do my best. I say that because some of you might think I'm breaking out into tongues or something up here, but it's decisio, which means departure. And what happened is all of the earliest English translations translated 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, as departure. That's what the Wycliffe Bible does. That's what the Tyndale Bible does. That's what the Coverdale Bible does. That's what the Kramer Bible does. Breach's Bible, Biza Bible, Geneva Bible. They all translated this noun apostasia as a physical departure. It is not until you get to 1611 where the King James translators translated it with the expression falling away. That is the first time that we begin to see a spiritual departure understanding of this verse. Now, why did the King James translators translate it as a spiritual departure when everybody else, going back to Jerome, thought it was a physical departure? And, and establish that it's not already happening. 
It says in that verse, in verse 3, not to let anyone deceive you, to trick you. And it isn't that people trick people because they're doing it maliciously. People themselves have been deceived. They've been deceived. They got it wrong. They've just got it wrong. And a lot of people get it wrong. And I can understand why you can get it wrong. Because this requires really screwing your mind down and thinking. It requires really looking at what God's Word says and following it and being willing to dig into a little bit of the depth of God's Word. Digging into the depth where, boy, you're, you're looking at some going back to the primary languages and looking at the Greek in the, the, behind these words and how they're translated and following that through and tracing these words through the way that they're used in God's Word to further establish the meaning of them. If you're going to get it right, you've got to be willing to do the work. You have to be a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, as it tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15, we need to be. We've got to be willing to take a look, and that's what we're going to do. There's a key phrase here, the two words falling away. Let no man deceive you, verse 3, look at it, by any means, for that day, the day of the Lord, shall not come except there come a falling away first. Is that me? No? Okay. I'm asking, guys, it's always me like me. I was like, who's got that phone? And then I, I did, a whole weekend went by, and we did that <laughs> once. We had this whole weekend meeting, this big event. And all weekend long, this phone keeps on going off. And I'm like so annoyed. And it's like, who doesn't turn off their phone? Yeah, especially when you hear it, like, over and over again. And finally I say, whose phone is that? It was mine. <laughs> I work out of the home. I don't carry a cell phone. It's like it never occurred to me. It's mine. It was mine. <laughs> so. Anyway. We're in verse 3. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Before the day of the Lord can come, something's going to happen. What's going to happen? There's going to be a falling away first. Now, that, those two words of falling away are critical because if you don't get what they mean right, then you can think that what you're seeing might be what this falling away is. They come from a Greek word, apostasia. That word, apostasia, in the Greek, its meaning, and as it was translated originally in the Wycliffe Bible and other earlier Bibles than the King James and some other translations since then, its meaning is departure. That's the basic meaning of that word, apostasia. It's used only one other time in the Bible. You can keep your ribbon or marker or finger or something there in Thessalonians, because we'll be back. But you can go to Acts 21. So this Greek word, apostasia, that's translated falling away, is only used one other place in the Bible, and that's Acts 21, verse 21. Where we read, And they are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Here in Acts 21, that word forsake is the same word from the Greek apostasia. The context of this whole thing is Paul's being, uh, you know, convinced, you know, bad idea, to go to the temple and to do this whole service thing and so forth. And he's being convinced with them telling them that people think that you have forsaken Moses, that you've left Moses. And you could supply the word departed from Moses, and that would still fit there, right? That would make sense. But it doesn't help really narrow down exactly what that, that means in terms of depart from. You see, the problem that comes with this word, this Greek word, apostasia, is the 
problem that comes to it because of the English word that has been derived from that Greek word apostasia. The Greek word apostasia has been transliterated over into the English apostasy. Apostasy? Apostasy. Apostasy. Okay. Apostasy. Um, transliterated is when you take a word and, and you carry it over to another language and you kind of only slightly change its spelling. And that's what's Greek from ap apost apostasia to apostasy is Greek to English. And apostasy, that word means like a falling away from the faith. So when people read in Thessalonians that that day won't come until there's a falling away first because of the current use of that word apostasy, they read into that that it won't come until there's a falling away from the faith. Does it say in Thessalonians that day won't come except there's a falling away from the faith first? No, it, even with that translation, it just says a falling away. But it really is a departure. You see, words change, the meanings of words change over time, especially when they move from one language to another. And I'll give you an example of this. <clears throat> the word critical or criticize has a very negative connotation to it today, right? You know, don't be so critical. Why? Well, how dare you criticize me? Very negative connotation, right? And that form of critical or criticize, that was, that begins, its etymology is it starts in the 1580s from the word critic. The word critic was carried over from the Middle French word critique, which merely meant one who passes judgment. A critique was one who passes judgment. Now that was taken, the French word critique was taken from the Latin word criticus, which means a judge or literary critic. And that Latin word criticus comes from the Greek word criticos, spelled with K's instead of C's, which means able to make judgments. So the original Greek word, able to make judgments, you can see the relationship of that word to criticize or critical, but is there anything inherently negative about able to make judgments? No. No. It doesn't have that same meaning that criticize has. Words change, and especially when they move from one language to another, and that is the case with apostasia, apostasy. We don't, its meaning does not rest on its current usage. Its meaning in the Bible rests upon its biblical usage. And words in the Bible have to be understood in light of their biblical usage, not their current one. That's a great key when it comes to interpreting the Word of God. We have to understand the words in God's Word according to the way that they're used in God's Word, not how they were used currently or even how they were used necessarily in classical Greek literature. I can point out some words that that becomes a problem with, such as Hades in the Greek. We dealt with that a couple of weeks ago, which is mistranslated hell in the King James, rightly translated um, just grave in the NIV because that's its meaning, but Hades in the Greek mythology brings a lot of baggage to it. So, again, the point, the principle is you have to understand this word according to how it's used in God's word. So we're going to look at that deeper. I told you it was only used in one other place, so that makes it tough, but we can look at related words. That word <clears throat> apostasia is the neuter form of the noun, the Greek noun. The feminine form of the noun is... <clears throat> used is apostasion, okay, apostasion, and that's used three times in God's Word. In Matthew 5.31, Matthew 19.7, and Mark 10.4. Now, you can make a note of that or just take my word for it, one of the two. In all three cases, it's speaking about divorce. So this is the same noun, just, you know, nouns have gender. In Greek. 
<laughs> this is the feminine form as opposed to the neuter form. In the three places where apostasion as opposed to apostasia, <laughs> see how closely they're related, the three places it's used, it's speaking about divorce, divorce, divorce. Somebody leaving the other one, okay, departure. He left her. We still use that term today. You know, when somebody gets divorced, they left him. They departed from him. It's not a matter of religious beliefs necessarily, right? It's just divorce. Here in the context that it's talking about divorce in those three places, it's got nothing to do with religious beliefs. It's just talking about divorce overall. So you see in those three places this idea of departure used specifically in the case of divorce. These nouns are related to the verb, I probably mispronounces, aphistemi. It's A P H I S T E M I. Okay. Just like you have closely related nouns and verbs like, that we're more familiar with, like agape and agapeo, okay? both of those are translated love. One is the noun form, one is the verb form of love, the love of God or to love, okay? agape, agapeo. Mm -hmm. Pistis, pistuo, believing or faith. Same concept. Love is the same concept, whether we're talking about it has having love or actually loving, it's the same concept, right? Believing is the same, has to believe, same concept. One is having believing, you know, have the believing of God, Jesus Christ said to his people. Or he said, fear not, only believe, right? Same concept, one's a verb, one's a noun. So the verb form of the noun Apostasia is this word that I can't say, aphistemi. It is used 15 times in the New Testament. Ten times, ten times it is translated depart. Okay? It is used 15 times, ten times it is translated depart. Why do I believe that apostasia should be translated departure instead of falling away because it is the noun form of this verb that is ten times translated depart. Once it's translated falling away, fall away, once it's translated draw away, once it's translated refrain, once it's translated withdraw thyself, and once it's translated depart from. Out of the fifteen times that it's used, only three have anything to do with somebody departing from the faith, and it is used in that way. And it can be understood in that way, depending on the context. But only three times is that word used in that manner. The rest are used in other ways, and we're going to look at some of those. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 37. Luke chapter 2, verse 37. This is an event that occurred right after Jesus was born, when he's taken to the temple. It says, And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed, there's our word, not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. This is talking about Anna, right? That was her name, Anna the, the prophetess, it says. This woman who was told that someday, if she hung around the temple long enough, she would one day see a couple bring in a baby, and that baby would be the promised seed. It would be that promised Savior. So there she is. She doesn't depart from the temple night and day because she wants to be there. You know, she's, I suppose, convinced that the minute she goes out for lunch, they're going to come and she's going to miss it. So she doesn't depart from the temple night and day for that whole time. That's the word, departure, depart, okay? She didn't depart. She didn't leave it. Got nothing to do with religious beliefs. It's got to do with not leaving a place physically.